Test, test, okay. All right, we're gonna get started. Test. There's still room at the front if people do wanna come. I promise we don't bite. <laughs> okay, uh, it's early morning for me because I'm from the US, so show of hands from everyone. Who in the audience loves virtual machines? Okay, pretty good. All right, who in the audience Show of hands, loves containers. A lot more people, okay. I saw some people who didn't raise their hands, so. You must be here to see us talk about scale and performance, so I, I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm Ryan Hallisey. I work at NVIDIA as an engineer. This is my colleague, Alay Patel, also from NVIDIA. And we're here to talk about CICD driven benchmarking, so measuring scale and performance that, that we do in QVERT. And what we're excited to share with you today, uh, talk to you about why this matters, and share with you how you can do it too. Okay, so first uh, we'll begin, I'll talk about uh, at a high level QVERT, what it is. Uh, and then I'll hand the mic over to Alay, and, and he'll go through and talk about scalability, how we measure scalability, uh, and then this idea of a control plane as a shared resource, something really important to keep in the back of your mind as we're going through. That control plane is a shared resource. And then we'll talk a little bit about QVERT's performance and scale stack and benchmarks, so things in ways we measure. And then we'll share with you how you can do this too as as someone who writes an, an, an API, someone who writes an operator, how you can do the same thing that we're doing in QVert. Okay. A virtual machine is a custom resource, right? So what does that mean? It's, it's, an, it's an extension of the Kubernetes API. So really when you're asking as the user for a virtual machine, you're going to the Kubernetes API server and, and what are you gonna get? you're actually gonna get a container, right? So this is interesting. So for all the people who raised their hands for both that love virtual machines and containers, just a shout out to you guys. We also love virtual machines and containers in QVert because we rely on them very heavily. So we get this container and we have the QVert control plane that does some work. We have inside this container, we've got a QMU process. We've got Livert. And then on the host, we've got KVI, we've got the hypervisor. And so we do the Kubernetes control plane does some work, generates an XML, and voila, we're in France, voila, we have a, we have a virtual machine. And from there, now you have a, if you think about it, it's a virtual machine running inside of a container. So that's what Kubert is. It's, it's a virtual machine running inside a container, Kuver pr provides that control plane, provides the API to interact with the user, to extend the Kubernetes API, to give you that experience that you can run a virtual machine just like you would in other, in other scenarios and other stacks, and runs it in a Kubernetes native way. Okay, so we work in NVIDIA and we use Kuver very heavily. And we rely on a lot of things, not just Kuber, we rely on a lot of things in the ecosystem. So what's our use case? So we have a cloud that we, we operate. Our use case is GPUs, right? We want to provide end users with GPUs. And so we, uh, particularly with, with GPUs, we want to provide users graphics. We want to stream graphics over the network to provide users uh, different experiences. Particularly, we focus a lot on this GeForce Now. GeForce Now is streaming graphics over the network so that you can play games. There's probably some people here who are familiar with GeForce Now. You can play AAA games on your phone. So we, we, we do the rendering in the cloud and we'll stream the graphics to you wherever you are. And so that all is powered by Kubernetes, powered by Qvert. And a bunch of other things we've got Oven we use um, for our network. We've got Gatekeeper we use, Prometheus, Grafana, uh, Flux, um, Fluentbit. So a lot of things that go into our stack. And so something to think about when, when Olay is talking, um, this is what um, 
you know, when, when she's going to show some examples and uh, of the, how we've measured and, and, and tested scale in our environments. This is, these are the things that we use, um, and this is what our stack looks like. Thank you, Ryan, for that introduction to our stack. So when we are running um, this stack in production, we need to make sure that the stack scales well um, when there is high load uh, for GFN. <clears throat> so in order to think about uh, power fan scale of that stack, we rely on the great work that uh, Kubernetes 6 scale has done um, to think about uh, power fan scale. The six scale Kubernetes has introduced something called scalability dimensions, which act as a guidance on how to think about uh, per fan scale. So three major things that include in that guidance. The first thing you need to think about is the environment in which um, the, the stack is running in. So it includes things like uh, Kubernetes version, what Kubernetes version you are running on, uh, what kind of hardware resources you have for the control plane, how it is configured, and the environment um, impacts greatly how the scale of the uh, how um, the stack scales. The second thing and the most important thing to think about is the scalability thresholds. So this means that it's the number of objects that the cluster needs to scale at. Um, the scalability thresholds, as you can see in the in the diagram. Um, they will differ for each uh, cluster use case. For us, uh, for the stack that we run, the scalability thresholds that matter are uh, object counts for pods, VMs, uh, nodes, uh, PVCs. Those are the key focus for us. Um, but it's, it's really important to understand that the scalability envelope that six scale, um, Kubernetes six scale has provided gives you a great way of thinking about um, thinking about power fan scale. And this diagram will look different for each um, Kubernetes cluster. Then the third thing is um, if you're using extensions, almost all production um, Kubernetes clusters use extension in one form or another. For example, mutating, validating webhooks. Um, those, should have, those should be used um, wisely all the extensions should be used wisely in the sense that if you're looking for high scale or low latency, the webhook should provide low latency, for instance. Um, <clears throat> the CRDs or the CRs of the extension um, should be within the, the scalability thresholds um, in this envelope. So once you have all of these three dimensions, you can determine the SLO for the uh, Kubernetes cluster that, that you are running. It is also important to understand that when we are thinking about the scalability thresholds, some of the work that the um, upstream Kubernetes 6 scale is doing can be used here. Um, so if you look at the diagram, um, the, the upstream 6 scale provides uh, dimension or scalability guidance on nodes, pods, PVC secrets. But then when talking about extensions, there are other things in the cluster that could impact scalability. So what we have found is that all the extensions like uh, KubeWord, OVS, Gatekeeper that we run, uh, they compound the number of CRs and hence compound the number of, uh, hence compound the scale um, of the cluster. Not only number of CRs, but, but they also, um, create some kind of um, client load on the API server, so in terms of the HTTP requests. So in order to reconcile those CRs, they will send HTTP requests to API server. And again, that has a compounding effect on, um, on how control plane scales. So the first four or five things are provided by six scale, but then the HTTP request and um, the, the scalability of KubeWord with respect to CRs is what we in, in the KubeWord 6 scale uh, focus on. In the rest of the presentation, uh, I'll focus on how these things can be monitored um, and measured to get an idea of scale. Just to prove, um, showcase an example of how these things um, cause failures at scale, um, we were seeing frequent of uh, API server uh, ohms in, in our stack. 
in order to, and, and one thing that was observed um, was that when, when we find an ohm, um, chances were that there were a large number of um, secrets existing in the cluster. So in order to root cause the actual problem behind those um, API server ohms, uh, we did an experiment. The experiment um, involved uh, creating around 5,000 secrets, um, 0.2 MB um, each, and then um, sending a list request against um, secrets. So a client is just asking for a list of those um, resources. And what we found is, you can see in the uh, charts that at that scale, in our environment, two or more concurrent list calls cause an API server outage. There is some kind of an inefficiency in the way API server handles list calls. This is a well-known problem um, in, in the Kubernetes community, and it's being handled by an enhancement, um, CAP 3157. If you want to learn more on what kinds of um, list calls are susceptible to um, these kinds of ohms, it's mentioned um, and explained very well in, in the CAP, and the CAP actually proposes a solution to work around those problems. But going back to the problem, you can see that in a large scale distributed environment, you could have an extension client that could potentially uh, make those two concurrent list calls. And because it makes those list calls in our environment, um, we were getting those API server ohms. So it's important to monitor what kind of um, load extensions and other clients on top of Kubernetes are creating against the API server. So when we found out about that experiment, we actually plotted a graph. Um, you can see on the x-axis number of requests, on, sorry, on the y-axis number of requests, and on the x-axis um, number of secrets multiplied by size of each secret. In this graph, anything in the green was perfectly okay for us. If you're on the graph, on the line, or outside the green domain, that's when, um, there were outages. So in order to scale up, let's say you want to have more than two concurrent requests in the cluster, you can either reduce the size of the secret or reduce the uh, maximum amount of um, scale in terms of number of secret the cluster can support. Either of those will help you um, increase the number of concurrent um, calls uh, the API server can handle. So hopefully this helps set the context that it's not just about the number of objects, it's also about the size of each object. And then on top of that, how many concurrent um, requests the API server is serving to the clients. Okay, so with that background, if, you are an, if you're writing an operator and if you want to measure a performance and scaling characteristics of that operator, how do you do that? <clears throat> so as Ryan explained earlier, KubeWord is just um, a CR, and there is a set of controllers um, behind the scenes that would make that VM um, running. So as part of KubeWord 6 scale, what we do is we define the scalability threshold in terms of the number of VMs, um, <clears throat> and then we monitor the client-side load that KubeWord generates in order to uh, make those VMs uh, go into running state. So to do that, uh, we at KubeWord 6 scale have uh, developed a benchmarking stack that helps uh, KubeWord monitor performance scale metrics for each release. And at the end of each release, um, those graphs will be shipped to the users so they can have an idea of what kind of performance scale um, uh, they can expect. Talking a little bit more about the benchmarking stack, it consists of three major layers. The first is the basic set of tools. Uh, <clears throat> so this layer includes uh, things like um, workload generator. So in order to performance scale test, we need some um, workload generator 
and that will create a bunch of VMIs in, in our test environment. Um, and then once we have those VMIs, we need certain kinds of metrics uh, and metrics monitoring. So um, we have a set of tools that creates um, a bunch of VMIs. When those VMIs are being reconciled by KubeWord, um, there is a monitoring stack which will continuously monitor the interesting metrics uh, from our perspective. Once we have this um, basic building blocks, we have wired this up into CI. Um, so these end-to-end uh, -end tests are run um, daily through a PRO, and the results from that monitoring is um, dumped into an S3 bucket. Um, so every day, at certain point, three jobs get run, and the results for those um, are dumped into an S3 bucket. Once we have the results into the S3 bucket, the next thing we need to do is aggregate those results and plot it in a graph. So the third layer will include um, scraping things down from the S3 bucket and uh, plotting it in a graph. Once we have a graph, we just um, release those graphs on, on the um, KubeWord release as benchmarks. Okay, so that benchmarking stack will produce a graph like this. So you can see these graphs are uh, P50 of um, VMI creation to running um, in terms of seconds. So how many seconds KubeWord um, stack takes in order to um, send a VMI or VM into running state? You can see that the graph is plotted over time and at some point, the trend line for the graph changed. Uh, at, at the green vertical line, we started to see that the performance uh, improved a little bit, and the observations were um, highly concentrated around, um, whereas previously, uh, those were a little bit more dispersed. So then, in order to figure out you know, what caused this problem? Um, we started digging in and we found out that um, at that time, we actually had changed the underlying uh, Kubernetes uh, provider uh, from 1.25 to 1.27. And because of that, um, there was an uh, increase in performance in the, the way pod gets to running. And because KubeWord relies on, uh, on a pod, uh, to provide you a VM. Uh, because of that, KubeWords metrics started to improve. So you can see that over time, if something changes in the environment, then that would lead to better performance. And having benchmarks like this can help understand exactly what change caused those uh, metrics to improve or degrade. So for example, all of those vertical lines in the, in the graph, they denote some kind of a change in, in the environment. Uh, apart from the green one, all the three vertical lines are uh, change in KubeWord um, releases. So we have plotted this for last three release, um, and we have shipped this as benchmark for V12. Not only that, um, as we, as KubeWord, uh, runs into its development cycle. Using this graph, a six scale periodically monitors if there are regressions in the, um, or improvements in the uh, metrics and finds out what exactly caused those uh, to happen. So for example, you can see further along the uh, time, there was a time when uh, the trend line improved a whole lot uh, and basically halved, um, what we found out at that time was that a monitoring change was introduced in the KubeWord um, benchmarking stack, which actually broke um, our collection of metrics. So this uh, second change that was identified was not a performance improvement, but actually a bug in, in the way we were collecting metrics. So these graphs are used to find out a bunch of problems in the cluster and uh, not, not just in the cluster, in uh, KubeWord development cycle, and 
we continuously monitor that as part of the six scale effort. Okay, so now that we have seen the performance benchmark, I want to introduce the scalability benchmarks. And the way these are different is that in the performance benchmarks, you get to see exactly how much performance is being uh, increased or decreased. But in the scalability benchmarks, you get to see how much load KubeWord stack uh, generates against the API server. So the idea here is that the exact cost of that uh, call um, is not something we could determine. Uh, the user of KubeWord will have to figure out if they, their environment can scale based on these benchmarks. So you can see um, in the graph about that the graph above shows uh, patch pod counts for a VM. So what, these, what this means is that if, KubeWord, if a user starts 100 VMs, how many patch calls does a KubeWord stack make against the uh, API server? And in, in one of the releases, we doubled the amount of patch calls that were made. So we went from around one patch call to two patch calls. And you can see that that is easily identifiable based on um, the benchmarks. And at that time, six scale um, figured out that the feature that was being shipped as part of this release was causing this uh, to increase. And it was actually OK, uh, because we were getting a good uh, benefit from that feature. OK. So hopefully, that showcases how, to, how we benchmark um, our KubeWord stack. Uh, now, the question is, how do you benchmark um, your operator? Right? So there are three building blocks, as I explained. One is um, having a set of tool set to start um, some amount of load in the test cluster. Um, there are well-known um, tools that are getting popular. One of the tools is uh, KubeBurner. KubeBurner allows you to uh, declaratively specify a YAML and say, OK, I want to create 100 VMIs. Put it in a YAML, and then KubeBurner will start and, and create those 100 VMIs for you. There are other tools. Um, for example, a cluster loader um, is something that is being maintained by Kubernetes um, 6 scale. So even that could be used to generate load. Once you have the load generator, the second part is uh, monitoring. Uh, controller runtime has a well-defined set of metrics that you could monitor. And if need be, um, you can also add more metrics on the client side. So what we have done in KubeWord is, in production, we don't, gra um, we don't collect a lot of metrics. But just for the end-to-end -end test, we have an environment variable that would collect much more in-depth uh, metrics um, during when the tests are executed. So this helps in making sure that uh, Prometheus does not have to collect a lot of detailed metrics in production. And you can keep the scalability of Prometheus sane. Um, at the same time, understand the scalability behavior of um, code changes through end-to-end -end test. Then, once you have these set of tools, um, uh, you can set up a CI automation. And instead uh, of putting things into an S3 bucket, which we had to do, um, you can actually dump metrics directly into um, Prometheus or Thanos. Um, and if that option is available, as a next step um, for your upstream or downstream project, you can actually wire up some kind of alerting rules that when these metrics um, they fall below or fall above a certain threshold, you get notified um, of a performance degradation. Yeah, so that's how um, you can take advantage of this um, performance and monitoring stack um, that we have developed and the ideas that, that we are trying to um, share with folks. Thank you. Um, if you have uh, feedback, um, please share with us. And then we have a few minutes for questions.
Hi. Uh, how do you create the, the group uh, by component graph in the first slide? I'm sorry. The, um, the, the graph that you created in the, in the group component, um, yeah, in the first slide. Representative in the sense. Okay, so repeating the question, how did I, um, how did we create um, this graph? Um, <clears throat> this graph is just to um, explain that there are other things in um, in terms of HTTP requests and the number of CRs um, and the extensions that KubeWord six scale. Sorry, Kubernetes six scale does not monitor, and it's important to look at those when you're running a production stack. It's not actually representative of the actual numbers. It's just, um, uh, you know, yeah, it, it's just denoting an idea. Uh, yeah. Okay, looks like there's no more questions. We'll be here for a few minutes afterwards if you guys want to come talk at all. Thank you very much, everybody.